with the 47 points this is their Swiss score Ely this is their Swiss score this is not their seed so it is going to be Ely as the higher seed yes. who's going to be going first and I think that makes for a more interesting matchup I think the Emerald Amethyst player when going first is going to feel really really confident and I think the fact that we're seeing Ruby Sapphire have the advantage being the higher seed is going to make things even more interesting yes I think I said 47 points if I didn't you did. I, no, you did. I apologize I was just wondering if there was a chance look at that let it go oh. they've got the foil let it go promo card which you get for getting top 128 there's Ooh. also teeth and ambitions in there this is the mulligan stage player going first and like they mulligan might... first okay so we're keeping three pitching four over on ely side there and Faustine does have that curse merfolk on turn one the question is when you go in second, do you keep a Curse Merfolk? It can be a little bit risky to do so, but I think up against Ruby Sapphire, you're absolutely going to hold on to this. There's a few uninkables, such as Diablo and Peter Pan Shadow Finder. Really, for Force they're going to be looking for as much early questing power as possible. They do keep a Diablo. They kept a Curse Merfolk and kept one other card. Yeah, the Merfolk, I mean, it's still a great turn one play. Unless you can show me a better turn one play, then I want to keep the Cursed Merfolk. You're right, it's better going first, but it's still a good play going second. And worst case scenario, it forces your opponent to answer it. So sometimes it can be nice to just force your opponent to expend resources getting rid of it. And if they don't, then the questing power gets very, very good very, very quickly. I'm so happy to see Eli with that Let It Go promo card in their deck. So it's going to, hopefully they didn't get rid of it in the mulligan. I, I imagine Let It Go is not necessarily a card you're going to hold on to in the mulligan unless you plan on using it for ink. But it's going to be great for our audience to see that card in the game. It is just an absolutely beautiful artwork, but with that special foiling, which you get for the Disney Lord card on a challenge cards, is just glorious. And with 100, you know, top 128 out of 2,000 players, that is a lot we see. Is that a queen? getting it? That certainly is. So this oh, Ruby Sapphire deck really focused on items, which is not the usual way we see it being built. With an ice block down on the board, that could be great. And we see improvising. It's not a card you see that often. I've been talking about it a lot for um, set five, but the Merfolk on one is exactly what you want if you're Emerald Amethyst. We see Tamatoa getting inked there. And I was telling you about Queen yesterday and how I thought it was an yeah. underrated card. Love seeing it in top 32 here. So back over to Fal in here we've got the cursed merfolk in the active will be able to quest this turn going and getting two law getting him off the board which is going to be lovely what do we have for a turn two play yeah so there's the ursula deceiver as an option but there's also a slightly unorthodox option which could be to play the snake and bounce the cursed merfolk back into hand perhaps anticipating that there could be that turn three sisu but it is going to be the ursula and there is no songs available so no discard available Look at that Sisu, double Sisu. Queen. Double Sisu, double Queen. Bearing in mind one got inks. So that's free Queen in the opening hand. Plus a Havisham there as well. I like that Queen card. I don't know if I want freedom in my opening hand, but at least they do work as ink. Yep, they can be inked. Very flexible card. And Eli's deck is very much built around this Queen and cards like Scuttle putting in big work. They have so many items in their deck. Cards like Maurice's Workshop, Shield of Virtue. It looks like the Queen is going to be inked and I think we're going to see the power of this uninkable Sisu here. It's going to be able to come in on turn three, banish a character with one strength or less which could be the Merfolk, it could be the Ursula but it's going to be the Queen instead. I love this. That's really interesting. Queen, you can exert it, and then you look at the top, is it three cards, four cards of your deck, you find an item card, and you can actually play it if it's, of course, three or less, I believe. Yeah, I'm really interested. Eli here deciding that they're not too worried about Forstein's questing power and can afford to just develop their own engine first and then perhaps remove the Kerfolk the next turn. That is, of course, going to mean Forstein's going to get two extra lore, which they otherwise, Eli, I could have denied so could be a pivotal moment that we look back on at this game to see was that the correct call from Eli it's definitely a really really interesting play and surely they know better than I do they've got a lot of experience with this Ruby Sapphire deck but it could come back to haunt them if Forstein's getting really really close to that 20 mark this two law Eli could have denied last turn could be pivotal it absolutely could that is something which always makes me nervous letting that curse merfolk quest but that queen does it's going to give a lot of utility we see a card being inked there 
Now we could play another queen if we wanted to go a little bit silly. Oh my goodness, we see the ice block on Diablo and the Sisu removes it with ease. The combo of dreams, ice block Sisu, goodbye Diablo. And the queen is not gonna challenge the Merfolk. It's nope. gonna exert to use its ability and the Merfolk remains and lives to fight another day. Bad news, no, no items. There is an oh, item. Oh, Maurice's workshop. And it's a three cost item played for free, absolutely maximizing the value of the queen. Yeah, I love that. You get to search an item from the top four. It's free or less, you get to play it. This is why the queen comes in. And we see maybe why the CC was being held there, yeah. because it actually was great up against the Diablo. We do still have CC in hand, so I still think there's a decent chance it comes down next turn, because that Merfolk, it's all, you know, Faustin's already up to five law. Ely here does need to stop them at some point. A lot of flying things in Faustin's hand. Yes. Yeah, it's such a fascinating start to this game. Eli on that turn three deciding to develop their own draw engine first. And Forstein just going to be able to get that extra questing power. If Eli was going second, I don't think they'd ever be able to make such a decision. But the fact that they're going first, they feel like they can get away with it. Pegasus has shifted in. Merfolk and Ursula are now evasive and cannot be challenged. What a play by Forstein. This Pegasus is drying on the ink, so it's not going to be able to quest or anything itself. But evasive on the Merfolk and Ursula. But this Sisu on the board is also evasive, Ross. And that is going to be really important for Eli. Yeah, it gives a challenging option. I'm just looking at e Ely's side of the board here. Three of the four cards they've got in play, we basically haven't seen in any list all weekend. No, absolutely. This is a very, you know, it might be Ruby Sapphire, but it is a very, very different Ruby Sapphire build. Now, we do have an ice block there. We have got a... Maurice's Workshop as well. So, Maurice's Workshop is whenever you play an item, you may pay one ink to draw a card. And Ely is really relying on this Maurice's Workshop shop as their card draw engine. Don't have cards like Dig a Little Deeper. Don't play things like Grandma Tala. Maybe not how far I'll go. Instead, going down that item route, which is really fascinating to see a Ruby Sapphire player with this approach and them succeeding so well. Yeah, it's always nice to see people doing something a little bit different. Makes me rather happy. Absolutely. So we're using a couple of ink here. We're using an ice block. We're drawing a card with the workshop. We are inking a card and... I mean, is it time for Sisu to take out the Merfolk? It could even be double ice block onto Pegasus, and the Sisu could even take out the Pegasus. Of course, if you challenge the Merfolk, you are going to be... But there it is, the Sisu Love onto it. the Pegasus. Double ice block Sisu. And now this Sisu could challenge Merfolk, but it would force e Lee to discard a card. We're seeing the Queen's ability now. Look at all those items. Shield of Virtue, Porpsicle, or Vitalisphere can be played for free but they'll come in exerted. And really fascinating to see the Shield of Virtue picked over the Porpsicle there. But it's interesting to note the other cards go to the bottom of your deck. There is now a B prepared at the bottom of the deck. We see a challenge with Sisu into the Merfolk, but that is one copy of B prepared, which is essentially out of commission for a while. Yeah. That's just not coming back, not anytime soon. And let's not forget, that was an evasive Merfolk right there. Forstein shifted in Pegasus to give this Merfolk evasive, but Ely with that Sisu, it has been the absolute star of the show in this one. The three cost uninkable Sisu putting in so much work. All I'm saying is, right, Ely's got a bunch of items being built up. You know who loves items? Okay, I, th I think I see where you're going with this. I feel like we've not seen many, many boards that have really taken advantage of it this weekend so far, but I do feel like Ely is building up to a potential gigantic Tamatoa line, and that would make me very happy in Indeed, we're not there yet, but it's just something to look out for. A Tamatoa right now would be questing for five. I know we don't have enough ink, we're not there yet. Yeah. But Faustin does not seem to be playing much item hate, much item removal here. No. So it feels like Ely can, you know, and it's not like we're playing a Havisham build here where we're just constantly getting rid of all the items to draw. We could see a gigantic swing turn as we see a Merlin Fox being inked and a non-shifted Pegasus coming into play. Yeah, one of the big uh, the big weaknesses of Emerald Amethyst is you don't have access to a card like Benja. Most of the item removal cards are not great, and therefore items can be a real problem. We do see the Ursula Deceiver quest for one, so Forstein is now at nine lore. Only 11 away, but Ely only at zero, but 
That's going to change pretty quickly as they continue to develop their board. This queen play on turn three was just so heads up from Ely, deciding that they just had the time to stall out thanks to the power of the Sisus, the double ice block as well. It's just been a tremendous start from this series by Ely. And keeping those ice block in play means you can just be constantly lowering power over and over again. It's a Tamatoa. That Tamatoa is in the deck confirmed. Ely with four cards, of course, from the Queen. So they're going to find a Porpsicle, and they're going to be able to play that for free. That is the only item they found. But this is the third time that the Queen has been exerted to play an item for free. It is. And Porp School comes down. There is a Tamatoa now towards the bottom of the deck, which is awkward. Although the more you play the Queen, the more the first cards at the bottom do get shifted up towards yep. the top. But there's four Tamatoa in the deck. We will be fine. I think my big shiny crab friend might be coming around. Here we go. Oh, the shift Sisu. Legendary Sisu. And with the ice block there, lowering Pegasus's strength. Boom. Down they both go. Wow, what a play. We're seeing the power of the ice blocks in this one. A lot of Ruby Sapphire players moved away from it, but this item heavy build is absolutely taking advantage of them. The Diablo one cost comes in from 14 and it sees a Flavisham and Flavisham means more cards where that came from. We see the Diablo legendary as well, but Ely is just looking in at absolutely dominant position right now. Yeah, this is going beautifully, of course. We do have Havisham here. We're not seeing it in this game. It's why we're seeing the items build up. But we can play Havisham. Oh, we see a whiff on the queen. But it does push things like that Be Prepared and Tamatoa towards the top of the deck. So it's not completely useless. And is that Havisham hitting the field, getting rid of that Popsicle? Now we draw cards. Yeah, there is a Scuttle in hand. There is also a Vitalosphere and oh, sorry? a Fortosphere. A oh, scuttle? No. no, it's scuttle. Okay, it oh, is well, a Vitalosphere. I thought I got the Vitalosphere. The Fortosphere is the steel one. Yes, I just know how you like scuttle, so I just really wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, the Shield of Virtue readies the Queen, and her ability has been used twice this turn. What a deck by Ely. It's absolutely glorious. I love this Queen. I keep telling people, I literally told you on the way you to did. dinner last night that I like this Queen. I think it's underrated, and I am very much enjoying watching Ely show us all just how underrated this card is. And between games, I've got a nice little story about Queen, but I'll save that. This game is too exciting. We've got Diablo coming in here, and we've got a Vitalosphere and Scuttle. Yeah. That is the hand. But there's so much draw available with Hiram Flavisham and all those items on the board, with Queen getting some items. And Maurice's workshop, there's so much potential here for draw on Ely's side of the board. That hand is deceptive. Yeah, and you're absolutely right, Ross. I've been very critical of, of the card Scuttle being in players' Sapphire Steel decks in the past, for example. But when you've got this many items, Scuttle is going to be hitting an item very, very consistently. And it has the potential to be an amazing card. And Ely has clearly found the right home for it with this deck as we see another item come down. But where's Tamatoa, Ross? I know you're waiting for it. I am. We've seen one so far, but it was from a queen that didn't work. We get Rush and the extra strength given to CC to take out the Diablo, of course. Sisu being evasive really helps. And I'm getting a hankering towards Ryo and the Last Dragon right now. I think this is the sixth time or so we've seen the Queen exerted to play an item for free. And she's hit every single time. No, was one whiff. Okay. It was one whiff. But hitting five out of six is fine by me, man. Yeah, absolutely. The Shield of Virtue is still on the board as well. We did see Ely decide to play that instead of a Porpsicle, and I was surprised. But then we see the synergy that it can have with the Queen. It comes through again. You're paying a little bit of ink. The Queen's going to ready and now challenge the Diablo, and it's not even going to take any damage back thanks to that Ice Block. What a combo deck this is. I am loving these combos. I, I really want to try this deck. Yes. I always, I would stay away from Sapphire a bit, but I'm telling you, this seems good. And here's the thing. Ely has now got up to 11 lore. Kept enough characters on the board to just do a little bit of cheeky questing here and there while building up that well of items and controlling the board with Sisu and Queen. And it seems like Ely is completely in control of this game one. This is absolutely beautiful play here. And if a Amatoa hits the board, it is over.
Yeah, and again, I just seen that turn three prey from Ely. I was so convinced they were going to go for the Sisu, but they felt confident enough to develop that queen engine on turn three, and then using the Sisu three cost uninkable to help control the board, those ice blocks, and really slow down force now. They were really starting off the game well. They got to like eight law very quickly, but since then it's been absolute dominance from Ely. Yeah, it's been just taking out everything Faustin plays down, just gets removed immediately. And Ely's doing the thing so many of these decks do when they're successful. Gaining law here and there when it's convenient, but really shutting your opponent down and building your board. The law kind of comes later. If you've got a much better board than your opponent, you're going to win. It is, let's get my board, control my opponents, everything else will come from there. Absolutely. Currently, there is quite a lot of questing power. Flavisham and the Queen for one, but the Sisu for three. So Ely, without the dime, is still able to quest for five. But Forstown is now also only eight away, so they're not so far away. They have three lore on the board potentially for themselves. But when you're up against Ruby Sapphire, I think you're fully expecting your cards to get removed pretty consistently. Uh, we do have, we've got Gaston, Maurice's workshop. There's an ice block and a Maui in hand. So we do see ice block lowering power. That Merfolk is a bit of a problem with evasive. We're using Queen here and we are grabbing ourselves. <laughs> a fishbone quill for nothing at all. Another, oh no, we're changing our mind. The fish hook. The fish hook. And there is a Maui in hand to use the fish hook if you want to next turn. Yeah, so Maui's fish hook, you can either give a character evasive or some extra challenging strength, and it's gonna cost you. But if you've got Maui on the board, it's gonna cost you nothing at all to do so. It is exerted for now, as the queen plays the item exerted but it could definitely be something that Eli could make use of. As a third ice block comes through. Eight items on the board here for Ely. And we do see Maui coming down, taking out the Diablo. Next turn, Maui's fish hook can give it reckless to take out the Merfolk. And I just, and we go up to 15 law. I don't think we even need to take out the Merfolk next turn. Faustin can get to 17 here. But what we got? We got one, two, three, four, four. We're not actually there yet for Ely. There's not eight law on the board. But there is a couple of dimes in the hand. Not one lucky dime, oh but my two. Goodness. I think we're good. I think, I think we may, yeah. And then that Sisu questing for free. You quest, you copy it with the lucky dime. That is six. And then we can just quest yep. Avisham. And, <laughs> and there we go. Ely wins game one in fairly dominant fashion yep. with one of my, maybe my favorite deck I've ever seen on stream. Yeah, it's got to be a contender, but I, I love that you just play that Diablo look at Ely's hand and then you're like, yep, double dime. Okay, time to go into the next game. Uh, of course, that means that the loser of game one is going to be going first in game two, and that is going to change things. Emerald Amethyst wants to be the deck going first, so that Curse Merfolk tips, whatever that might be. Faustin here needs a better start than last game, so we had the Merfolk, but very little else. Yeah, that Merfolk on turn one was definitely nice, but when, when going second, it just gave Ely that opportunity to really get back control of the board. They were able to be greedy and play that queen on turn three. But in this situation, when Ely's going second, I would really expect them to be looking for that Sisu play on turn three to just answer the questing power as quickly as they possibly can. They're not going to have many characters on turn one and turn two either. Sapphire preferring to play items on turn one and turn two. You can see Porpsicle, Ice Block. There's that Vitalisphere. We know they have Shield the Virtue as well. So, so many one-cost items for Ely. Might struggle for one-cost characters, which means that three-cost Sisu on turn three could be huge. Now, Ely's put down the cards. Are they not mulliganing anything, Ross? What's going on here? Ely going second. I mean, if they've, well, if they are going second, you do have the opportunity to make your opponent do their mulligan first. Absolutely. Whoever's going first has to mulligan first. And we see a lot of the time, people just don't worry. They just yep. go for it. But there is extra information to be gleaned. How aggressive is your opponent mulliganing? The general rule is the more aggressively they're mulliganing, the worse their hand was. Yep. The, if they only put one or two back, you need to think my opponent has got what they want. They're playing on their preferred curve, one cost on turn one, two cost on turn two, etc. I need to be a little more careful. If they've kept one card, could that be the Cursed Merfolk? Yeah, it could be. That's what we're thinking if we're Ely here, but it's good, relevant information. It's very rare to see a player keep their entire hand pre-mulligan. Yeah. It happens, but it's rare. 
Yeah, and also, not only are you gaining more information about your opponent's hand from their mulligan, but you're also making sure that you're not giving your opponent any unnecessary information, because if, if Ely was about to mulligan seven cards, Fawcett might feel a little bit more confident about keeping a few more, so definitely makes sense as the player going second to use every advantage available to you, and just waiting to confirm your mulligan until after your opponent has done it is something you can absolutely expect to see the very best players doing at this level. Yeah, and we are one game away from Ely for getting that invitation to the European Championships, getting that Rapunzel playmat, and of course, a shot at the Mickey next round. This is the first real, what I like to call, pinch point of the tournament. This is where we're going to separate the players who get the invite from the players who don't. Okay, so I'm looking at Ely's hand, and I'm not seeing many one-cost characters. In fact, I'm not seeing a single one-cost character. And what's more, Ross, I'm not seeing a two-cost character either. Are they mulligan six cards? So you can certainly imagine that they were looking for some more cheap characters to play down onto the board. No Curse Merfolk on one, and for Ely, that is going to be music to their ears. That's basically an extra turn for Ely here. It's, it's as good as, in some ways, it's as good as just going first. Your opponent, okay, they got the first ink, but no Diablo, no Curse Merfolk. That is a huge win for you, because let's face it, you're going to jump ahead in ink. You're playing Sapphire. So this is just wonderful here. I love love that we're doing this. Although I say that, is Edie playing any ramping cards? There is the Fishbone Quill. Of course there is. Okay. So yes, Edie will, it's in hand as well. So Edie is going to be going ahead on Ink at some point. Seeing your opponent whip is huge. And again, no two cost card. So Faustin is just inked and passed, inked and passed. Two pops go from Ely here. Two extra cards in hand. And next turn is where Edie really wants to start going with stuff like Queen. And why play Sisu when this has been your opponent's star? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm liking turn three Queen here. There was an absolutely huge huge grimace from Forstin when this uh, second turn card draw came through as it was not a playable character. There's the Curse Merfolk. A little bit late for Forstin's sake. Would have liked that on turn one. Would have, would have even liked it on turn two. Could, of course, come down later on. On turn three, it looks like it's going to be a Diablo. Not a quick questing card either. The good news is Ice Block not available for Eli because Ice Block plus that turn three uninkable Sisu could have been curtains for Diablo. Yeah, that would have been terrible getting that quite so early. Not there now, but as soon as we get this third ink down, we are going to potentially have a queen in play, and that is going to be a rather handy bonus indeed. We could see the queen inked and the queen played. The other inkable cards are Maui, Fishbone Quill, Flavisham, and Maui's Fishhook. It is a queen inked. And surely it's going to be another queen play, but perhaps it could also be the fishbone quill here. Not too worried about the early questing power. Does decide to go for the queen as a potential engine. We saw how valuable that was in the previous game. And Hard drawn off the hop is friends on the other side. Yeah, and I'm just thinking you could use queen and potentially get a fishbone quill next turn anyway. That's very true. Very, very true. So friends is sung by Diablo. Two more cards in the hand. There is Queen's Castle, there's an Ursula Deceiver, Curse, Merfolk, Pegasus as options. Three ink available. And of course, they are also still able to ink this turn to get up to four ink. Could play the Queen's Castle Mirror Chamber, that could be fun. Pegasus looks like the card that Forcing is considering to ink, but just having some second thoughts about that. No shift target available just yet. It's definitely a line that you're looking to do quite often with Emerald Amethyst is shift in this Pegasus and give all your characters like Curse, Mo Curse Merfolk evasive. We fourth force in, go for that exact play in game one, but the evasive power of Sisu and the ice block really shut down that, that line. It absolutely did. Now we see the Ursula being inked. Here is the Queen's Castle Mirror Chamber, getting that two passive law return, basically forcing Ely to deal with it. And with seven willpower, it's actually a very annoying thing to deal with. I've got good news, Ross. Ely's just drawn Tamatoa. Yes, we didn't see it last game. We might see it this game. We see Maui's fish hook come wow. down. Oh my goodness. We're seeing Maui's fish hook. We're seeing the Vitalisphere go on to the Queen. 
and it's going to challenge the Queen's Castle for five damage. And the Maui's fish hook preferred over the fishbone quill, which seems odd, but when there's a Diablo on the board, this Maui's fish hook has the opportunity to give one of your characters evasive, and there's a Maui in the hand. So Maui can rush in, be given evasive for no cost at all by the Maui's fish hook, and Maui's fish hook and Maui combining to potentially remove an evasive Diablo. Yeah, that will work. And then, of course, the Queen could potentially just finish off this Queen's Castle Mirror Chamber. And then your opponent's got nothing. And this is what we saw from Ely back in game one. Let the law take care of itself when it's appropriate. Build up your items and shut your opponent's board down. Counter everything they do and grab law at convenient times. We had the possibility for a big law swing with Tamato. We see happen. improvise a huge play. Diablo now with three strength until the end of the turn and it could now remove the queen as an option. It did also draw a card. So Diablo with three strength until the end of Forstein's turn here. You've got to think that is to try and get roll. Oh, a second Queen's Castle. Queen goes down, and this is annoying. The Diablo does actually trade with the Queen, but Faustin here is just going passive. Law from the castle is too good. But it's Maui time, and there we wow. go. out the Queen's Castle in one go with the extra strength you get from the fish hook. Maui can't take down the Queen's Castle, but with his hook. Yes. Absolutely amazing. I mean, these Queen's Castles are such a weakness of Ruby Sapphire. We see a lot of Ruby Sapphire players playing the Vitalisphere, but Edie's got not only the Vitalisphere, but the Fish Hook as well. Even the Shield of Virtue can allow characters to challenge twice in a single turn. So Edie has so many answers to the Queen's Castle, which is often considered the biggest weakness of Ruby Sapphire. It is glorious to see the deck building on show here. Yeah, I am absolutely loving this, making sure you've got answers to everything to which you need to have answers and this is beautiful from Ely here and once again you look at the board Ely's got some items down you've got your Maui down on the other side of the board it's not looking so good we do see the Merlin rabbit come down Ursula get inked and a cursed merfolk a double Hello. cursed merfolk now we might be talking yeah foreseen in an ideal world would have been playing like a merfolk on turn one and then two more merfolks on turn two so it's definitely late to be getting these merfolks down, but it's certainly better late than never. Ely going to be really hoping to find that legendary Sisu at this point, because that would remove the whole board. It's going to be Flavisham for four ink, and the Porpsicle is banished. Ely drawing two more cards for their trouble. Scuttle and Flavisham were drawn. And we're inking a Flavisham. Time for Scuttle. Is Scuttle going to do the business? They're going to look at four cards, and an item is able to come into the hand. And Scuttle hits so many items available. The consistency of Ely's deck is really paying off. Goodbye, Queen's Castle, as Maui trades into it. And Maui has now been given evasive as well, it seems, by the fish hook. And now we've got five ink, uh, sorry, five law coming down from Faustin. We'll only put him up to nine. Not there yet by any strength for the any stretch of the imagination. But is starting to get a little bit a little bit closer here. The double queen's castle was scary, but it was dealt with. The double cursed merfolk is scary. Hopefully they'll be dealt with by Ely here. Still no law. Still in that phase of the game where you're really going after your opponent's board. And for Faustin here, it's just, I'm going to get some cards down. Can I get some benefit out of them before they inevitably go away? And if I can do that often enough, I can squeak this game too. Faustin deciding to sing friends on the other side with the rabbit. So they can still quest for four here this turn with the merfolk. Going to have a peek at Ely's hand with the Diablo. Sees that dreaded Tamatoa. Maurice's workshop, Ice Block, and Shield of Virtue are available. So knows that there's no threat of that Sisu coming through just yet. But of course, lots of card draw available for Ely with that Flavisham on the board. Yeah, Flavisham is a great option. It's nice building up a store of items, but sometimes using Flavisham to draw can be just as good and lovely. So, uh, and if, if you're Faust in here, it's a really awkward decision because you, if you quest, if you can just keep questing, but you know your cards aren't going to last that long. You know that Sisu is an option coming down. You know that Ely can give evasive to Maui to go after them potentially. Lots of draw to replace the cards lost when you challenge the Merfolk. And you've only got four cards in hand. You've got no draw engine on the board. So 
you don't want to get to like 12, 13, 14 law and end up with no cards yeah. in hand and nothing on the board. So I believe what Faustin's thinking here is, look, I, I can get some law here with the Merfolk. That's great. That's lovely. How am I going to get this working for the rest of the game? Yeah. Because I need to finish this out. I think the line for Forsyn that they're considering, they have a five-cost Pegasus in hand. They don't currently have that one-cost Emerald Pegasus. If they can shift in Pegasus, they can get evasive on all of their cards. And that could allow them to get that extra turn of questing they're looking for. The risk for that is, if you don't quest this turn with the Merfolks, it's a, there's a very good chance Ely's going to draw into that legendary Sisu. And therefore, the Cursed Merfolks would be removed. But in this position, Forstein's maybe left with no choice but to take a risk like that at this moment in time. And I really like to see them really taking their time at a big moment. Five ink going to be exerted. It's probably going to be the Cricky as the option, which can quest for three. But it is, in fact, just going to be the Pegasus deciding not to go for that shift Pegasus line and instead just questing instead. I love how Forstein really slowed down at this moment in time. It was a big decision. They could have gone for that risky line to try and draw into the Pegasus, but they decide it's just too risky and not worth it. And sometimes that's where you've got to go, and it does seem to be working. We've got a Tamatoa hitting the inkwell here. So no Tamatoa in hand anymore. We see Maurice's workshop being played, adding another item to the pile. And now it looks like we're paying two ink for a Shield of Virtue and an Ice Block. Oh, Ice Block's lowering the power of Rabbit. Maui's taking out Rabbit. Yeah, so Maui only taking one damage back, and then Scuttle and Flavisham are going to challenge the Merfolks, which is going to force Ely to discard. But that Lucky Dime, while it's in the discard pile, it can be fetched pretty comfortably by our friend Tamatoa later on. Forcing at eight law, 12 away, can quest for three to get to 11, and that evasive Pegasus isn't going to be super useful with the power of the Maui's fish hook on Ely's side of the board. Yeah, having an evasive character questing for two is great because it's so hard to get rid of for a lot of decks, but Maui's fish hook here giving the perfect answer, and it does feel like Ely's got the answer to pretty much everything in Faustin's deck here. It might not be this case for every matchup, but right now, you've got your evasive cards, don't worry, I've got that. You've got your a really good questing low power cards don't worry i've got an answer for that as well and you're not doing so great at having an answer to my items you don't have much item removal in your deck do you have a rabbit though yeah rabbit hitting the board gonna be a card drawn for forced in has a few ink remaining i believe two ink remaining does find that one cost Pegasus. Just so, in time. Yeah, probably a little bit too late, unfortunately. They decided to, to shift in that Pegasus, but I think because they played the Rabbit this turn, it possibly would have been too late anyway. They only have two ink available if they played the Rabbit and drew into the Pegasus. They wouldn't have the four ink necessary to play the Pegasus and shift the Pegasus. So Fortunately not. What they can try to do is quest, and then while their characters are exerted, they can be bounced back to hand and replayed readied with cards like the Madam Mim, Snake, and Fox. That could allow them to get that extra questing power. Ely doesn't have much questing power at all and has no cards in hand currently, but that Flavisham is on the board with evasive and can draw cards very, very quickly. Yeah, it really can. It works very nicely indeed. So a lot of decisions being made here by Faustin. Ahead in the board in terms of law by having 8-0, to zero, but not as good a board position. And we saw what happened back in game one. So your Madam Mim Fox comes in, takes out the Maui. There is a trade there. Both those characters go down. Maui was being a little bit of a pain. Gets up to 11 law here. And now it's over to Ely to decide, you know, building your board is good and playing keep away is good, but you do at some point need to start, you know, getting some stuff rolling. We got four items down after using Hiram Flavisham to draw two. With the questing, we've got an ice block down now. Maurice's workshop is going to be triggered to draw another card. So Ely started the turn with no cards in hand, drew for the start of the turn for one. They've played an ice block, and they still got three more cards in hand. That is the power of this Flavisham and Maurice's workshop, as we see the scuttle combining with the fish hook to remove the Diablo. And that Pegasus is still on the board, still with evasive. But the ice block plus Sisu is going to remove it from the board. Oh, and the oh, grimace oh. from Forstein tells you all you need to know. 
And we are now getting to that stage. It's like a lot of sapphire decks. You are going to fall behind. The question is, can you get enough setup rolling while you fall behind to bring it back in the late game? And Ely might be there. We've got three characters and five items on the board. You have completely gotten rid of your opponent's board in its entirety. You are down by 10 law, but you've got enough ink there that Tamatoa is now an option. And a Tamatoa Lucky Dime combination could get you to 20 law very quickly. Now, there is a go in Forstein's hand, and there is a snake as well. So this bounce potential can start coming through for Forstein and get them to that 20 mark very quickly. Let's not forget, Ross, this was a game where Forstein missed that turn one and turn two character. Yes. But they're still in this game. It is not over yet. If you can get to 16 law, it's only a go and a few bounces away from getting to 20. That is a worry when you're playing against any deck with a bounce engine. If they get, there's a lot of decks will get to 16, 17, sputter out, not win. But because you've got the goat, you can play it, bounce it, play it, bounce it, etc. And then it goes away and it gets another law and it finally gets taken down. And getting that last three or four law with the goat bounce combination is so much easier than most other decks getting those last few law. There's a few other ways to do it, like the super goof that I won't shut up about, which still never actually sees a huge amount of play. But in terms the cards that you can play and immediately get law to get you over the line there aren't that many it really is the goat that is pardon the pun the goat here yeah absolutely so there is i think seven ink available here for forstein they have a goat they have a couple of diablos they have a rabbit and maybe at least one snake quite possibly two the problem with these diablos is the card draw at this stage is just too slow. Yeah. They're only questing for one, but they're also uninkable. In fact, it's only one Diablo and it's a Cricky. So one Diablo, one Cricky, who does quest for three, could be a really interesting option for Forstein to try and get some questing power with. They're still deciding on exactly what to do at this stage, and it is gonna be the GOAT. So they're up to 12, and it's going to be the snake as well, up to 13. And this is the power of the goat, that goat back in hand. Forcing can draw into some more bounce targets. That 13 law mark can keep being bumped up, slowly creeping towards 20. It's on Ely. They have the Flavisham on the board for more card draw. Tamatoa and Lucky Dime in hand. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. That is a combo. Ely right now sitting on one law to Faustin's 13, but this gets big quickly. Um, yeah, you need to play the Tamatoa just to open up the questing the following turn, honestly. The Shield of Virtue banished by the Flavisham. Gaston inked. Be Prepared was also drawn. I don't expect to see Ely playing Be Prepared here, Ross. No. You've got your Flavisham, your Sisu, and your Tamatoa, as well as Scuttle. And your opponent's just got the Madame Mim Snake. And here's the thing. Next turn, Tamatoa is questing for a minimum of six... Plus, then Lucky Dime will get another six. If you can play one item, it's game next turn. One item, Tamatoa quest for seven. Lucky Dime gets seven. And, um, oh, no, but you would need it. You, yeah, because you need Tamatoa to quest for seven. Oh, no, because then you've got Scuttle and Havisham. No, you've got game on board. Okay. I'm overthinking this. Sorry. We've got Tamatoa will quest for 12... 16. No, you will be... No, you'll actually be one short. But yeah, so what you can do is you quest with Tamatoa, you will get yourself six lore, then you yep. get an item back, play it down, yep. and Lucky Dime copies for seven, that's 13, puts you up to 17. Certainly quest does. Havisham, Scuttle, Sisu, 20, boom! Yep. Game is on board for Ely right now. I like doing the Tamatoa maths. Yeah, so Forcing does therefore <laughs> need to remove this Scuttle at very minimum. Can do so with the Snake. They've got a goat, a rabbit, a Pegasus one cost character in hand as well. Now, the Maui's Fishhook did not give anything evasive this turn, so all the characters on Ely's side of the board, apart from the, the three cost Sisu, are not evasive. It is going to be a rabbit, possibly hoping to find a fox here, as this would allow them to quest with the snake, and they do find exactly the fox. They now, rather than having to challenge with the snake, in theory, they could take the risk and quest with the snake, rush him with the fox, and remove the scuttle that way, because that's just going to allow Forstein to get that one extra law, and every law at this stage is going to matter. They are going to be inking Cricky, it appears. That is the card they're hovering over. Of course, they'd love to use that fox on the Merlin down the line as well. That could also be an option. 
It's going to be four. It's going to be for Pegasus Diablo. Are we going to see the snake challenge the scuttle, or is the snake going to quest? Uh, you, you've got to take that one. Unless I've made a mistake with my maths, I think game is on the board for Ely here. It's a quest. It's a quest for 14 up to 14. 16 law needed for Ely but in a single turn. We should be able to get this. So we are seeing the brawl getting inked. So first we're going to play the lucky dime, I believe. Yeah, and 14 didn't know that dime was available. And then we've, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, yes, that's already it. So Tamatoa Quest, Lucky Dime Copies, Quest with a couple of the others, and that is it. That is the game. We go from four to actually 21 at least. Wow. Because I forgot with Tamatoa, you play the Lucky Dime, and you don't even need Tamatoa. Of course, Tamatoa could get more, but it doesn't matter. Ely gets all the way from four to over 20 in one go, moves on to top 16, and gets that invite to the Disney Lorcana European Championship. Championships, and you could have quested with Tamatoa, got an item, played it, yep. then lucky dime. So you, I think you could have got to like 22, 23 then, yep. but it's all irrelevant. Tamatoa, lucky dime. What a 